again, everyone. Can I welcome you back? So in the last session, one of you asked about the first year program. And that was a great question, and I asked you to hang on to it. So I hope we answer it for you in this uh, session. We've spent part of the morning um, introducing you to the essentially the upper year program, the range of offerings uh, that we have in our, our program, uh, our JD program. Uh, you're introduced to much of uh, those areas in your first year. But our first year program, like every law school's first year program, is a bit of a set piece. So we welcome 280 of you in, the, uh, in August, and we divide you into four sections. And we are so creative, we call those sections A, B, C, and D. Uh, and they are sections of about 70 or so, you know, give or take, sometimes a little bit more, uh, students. And you will be with your, you will be either in section A, B, C, or D for the entire first year. You will, we will, there are two first year well, actually three uh, first year programs taught in both terms. The first is ethical lawyering in the global community, which you've heard Professor Farrow speak about. And also uh, state and citizen, which is a, our public law, constitutional law course, which is offered in, for the entire year, for fall term and, and winter term. And of course we call legal process, which introduce, introduces you in the fall term to legal research and writing skills and techniques uh, and in the winter term becomes reconfigured as a course essentially in, in civil procedure. Uh, it is in the context of that course that you will do your first year moot. We don't burden you with too many choices in the first year program. Uh, you'll do contracts, criminal law, and torts in the fall term, and in the winter term you will, uh, in addition to state and citizen and legal process, and in the winter term uh, you'll, you'll write your fall, final exams in the fall in contracts, torts, and criminal law, and in the winter term, we introduce you to uh, property law and, as I say, civil procedure. Uh, where we do uh, offer you some choice is in the, a program we call Prospective Options, and we offer about 20 uh, seminars that are intended to, and from which you can choose, uh, to introduce you to uh, law in an interdisciplinary context, and uh, it's in that context that you uh, learn some research and writing skills. And the, 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 it's a cornucopia, that's all I'll say. It's a cornucopia, everything from uh, indigenous peoples in the law through to uh, Islamic law, through to law and poverty, through to law, risk and regulation, globalization, uh, tax as an instrument of social and economic policy. The sky's the limit. And if you go onto our website, you, you, you should be able to see our list of prospective option courses. We have dedicated first year instructors. At Osgood, we are committed to involving our, our full time faculty in the first year program. And I, we have, we're, I'm so pleased to have with us this morning uh, some of our stars in the first year program who will essentially introduce you to their subject uh, through a case. But let me introduce you to them first and then I'll tell you a little bit about the case. So to my immediate right, a guy you've met already, the lovely and talented Trevor Farrow, who teaches, uh, as I say, in the ethical lawyering uh, program as well as a legal process in the winter term. Uh, to uh, Trevor's right, another guy you've met already, Assistant Dean, uh, Bruce Ryder, who teaches both state and citizen in the first year, uh, and he's also a torts, uh, torts teacher, and it's in that context that he's here with you this mo with us this morning. To uh, Bruce's right is Professor Stephanie Beneshai, one of our national scholar, or nationally re recognized scholars in the area of bankruptcy <coughs> and insolvency, pardon me, and she teaches contracts um, in the first year, in the fall term, and then two to Stephanie's right, again, someone else you've met already this morning, our own little rock star, 
James Robopoulos, who will speak to you about criminal law. So th these are four first-year instructors, and they've been tasked with the following, to uh, explain how they would approach uh, a case that's a very famous case in uh, English common law in, in, called Donahue and Stevenson. Has, has anyone heard of this case ever? So some of you have. So Donahue and Stevenson was a decision, a case that was started in Glasgow. The facts of the case, the incident that gave rise to it, came from Glasgow. It went its way up through the courts in England and in the early 1930s was decided by um, the modestly named uh, House of Lords. Now, what was this case about? In about... 1929 um, or so, uh, a woman named May Donahue, a, a, a Glaswegian, is that what we say? A, a woman from Glasgow. A woman who was, who'd had uh, a, a very hard life. A woman of, to say, modest means would be to say the least. She was a poor woman. She, she'd been born into a working class uh, Glasgow family, married at 17, uh, it had, I think it's fair to say, um, I think perhaps our euphemism might be a difficult marriage, and she was uh, separated and, the, and a sole, single mother, single parent uh, by the age of 29, and had to find a way uh, on the eve of the Great Depression to find a way to support herself and her young children. She found work mercifully and a place to live uh, with her brother in his shop. One night, she met a friend. She decided she was invited to join a friend uh, to go for um, an ice cream. And so she, imagine this, traveled about 30, a 30-minute 30 trek across Glasgow to meet her friend at an ice cream parlor and for an evening of uh, sociability and uh, discussion, conversation. So she, her friend ordered for May. Um, do you know what an ice cream float is? See, I think that's something that died with my generation. So uh, it, it was a, um, a, couple, a couple of scoops of ice cream. You're not going to believe they did this. And in my generation, we would pour Coca-Cola over it and kind of unsightly. But we liked it when we were 10. Uh, so May. Uh, her, May's friend ordered for her uh, an ice cream float, uh, which consisted of a couple of scoops of ice cream and a, a drink called a ginger beer. And the ginger beer, wa and the, I think the friend had something else, a pear and ice for herself. And the ginger beer came in a dark bottle. And I th my understanding from the, th this area is that the, the dark bottle of ginger beer was uh, too make the kind of sediment that tends to collect um, in some beverages not visible. And so there's a dark bottle of ginger beer. Now the friend, as I say, ordered the uh, ice cream float for May. The friend paid for it immediately. The owner of the, she was, they were served uh, and, they, and May's friend, as I say, put the order in and paid the uh, owner, uh, whatever that small amount was, uh, for, the, for, the, for the items that they were about to consume. And then May tucked in and ate her ice cream, and halfway through, her friend kindly reached over and poured the remnants, the rest of the bottle of ginger beer, onto the uh, ice cream. And the rest, as they say, is history. We think, and certainly this was at the heart of the case, that out of that, out of that bottle emerged a decomposed snail. And if you think an ice cream float is unsightly, imagine it with a decomposed snail. Um, and May was upset. Um, 
And she, I think, thought about what she'd eaten and then had to deal with the sight. And of the, she got very sick, very sick. Unpleasant things happened as she emptied the contents of her stomach. And she was sick for a week. Oh, no, actually, she was sick for a month. She was off work for a month. Now, remember that she didn't have a lot of money, and she was living and working in a time where things like unemployment insurance and, what, and, and, and a job without benefits came. So she lost work uh, for a month. And she thought that she should do something about this, and so she took herself uh, to a lawyer who had made a bit of a specialty in his practice of helping Glasgow's uh, underprivileged and, uh, and was committed to access to justice. Now, remember that uh, May's friend paid for the drink, for the, for the float, um, and, and he, the owner of the restaurant hadn't uh, put the snail in that bottle because, in fact, I, a little bit of the facts I neglected to mention, he'd, she, he'd opened it for her at the table, so uncapped it. So um, May's lawyer decided he'd go after the uh, bigger fish, the manufacturer of the uh, ginger beer, uh, a man named Mr. Stevenson, hence the name of uh, the case Donahue, May versus Stevenson. And I will leave it to my colleagues to tell you what happened next. Remember that May's friend bought, ordered, and paid for the drink? Remember that the owner didn't know that the snail was there? And I think you can also remember, take it from me, that, that Mr. Stevenson had not intentionally put that snail inside the drink, didn't know it was there, what could be done? The first year instructors of Osgood Hall Law School are about to tell you how they would approach this from their subjects of legal process, torts, contracts, and criminal law. Go. <laughs> You're doing torts, right? You're doing torts. Thank you so much, Associate Dean Gavigan. My name is Bruce Ryder, and I'm, uh, as the Associate Dean said, I often teach torts in the uh, first, first year curriculum. And Donahue versus Stevenson, out of the humble story that Associate Dean Gavigan has just told us, has had a massive impact on the evolution of tort law and, and on society uh, over the course of the last 90 years. And, and it's probably the most important uh, torts case that we study. So it would be right front and center in, in the torts course, one of the first cases that we would discuss, and we would come back to it throughout uh, the fall semester. And it, one of the things that's very perhaps difficult to comprehend from our point of view now is at the time in the late 1920s, it was taken for granted that manufacturers um, uh, uh, or, or, or sorry, at the time, it's taken for granted that manufacturers do not owe their consumers a duty of care to take, that is to take reasonable care in, in um, how they go about producing their products. Something that we take for granted does exist now, and uh, Donahue versus Stevenson was the start of, or the leading case, has become the leading case on the law of, of products liability. Um, Tort didn't used to play a role in consumer protection, and now it plays a huge, huge role. I should say just a word about what tort law is. Tort law is um, defined as a civil wrong that is contrasted to a criminal wrong, uh, other than a breach of contract for which the law provides a remedy in the form of an award of money damages. So situations where people sue another person to recover for their losses. And the issue is always, when is it right or just to shift some, the, the costs of an injury from the plaintiff, the person bringing the suit, to the defendant? Can we say that the defendant should be responsible for the losses caused by this injury? In this case, should May Donahue be able to hold the manufacturer of the ginger beer liable for the losses associated with her, uh, her illness, the, the costs of, of health care, the lost wages, her, her pain and suffering? And the story of Donahue versus Stevenson is not just the story of the evolution 
of uh, tort law and negligence law, the most important branch of tort law, but it's also very much a parable about the tension between continuity and change in the law. Many students are attracted to the law because they see it as uh, a stable uh, force, uh, an arena characterized by certainty, objectivity, order, predictability. And it's true that in some ways the law is very much bound to history and tradition through, for example, the doctrine of precedent. But at the same time, the law is always dynamic and in flux. It's not just a static body of rules. It's not always predictable. And uh, this can be very unsettling for law students at the outset, but I think it becomes inspiring for uh, students of the law because one of the things that we're trying to teach you to do is to understand how to marshal the dynamics of change, how to be aware of shifting values and social conditions that compel the re-examination and reformulation of legal rules. That, that's what makes the study of law so challenging and exciting. And if you cast, cast your minds back to the 1920s and the growth of the consumer uh, economy and of uh, uh, modern forms of mass production and mass consumption, imagine that it would start to feel odd for judges and lawyers that consumers had no protection against negligently manufactured goods that caused them injury unless they had a contract with the manufacturer because that was the situation at the time and uh, Walter Leachman who was the Glasgow lawyer that May Donahue went to felt very strongly that manufacturers should owe a duty of care not just to the people who directly purchase their products but also to anyone who consumes them and so we had fought a number of cases in the Scottish courts uh, involving, there were a lot of ginger, seemed to be a lot of bottles of ginger beer that were contaminated with, with unsavory <clears throat> elements. There were some cases involving mice in the bottles of beer. And it's important to point out that these bottles of beer, you couldn't see through them. They were opaque. So you couldn't um, see before consuming that there were um, uh, these problematic substances in them. And he'd lost these cases uh, consistently until Donahue versus Stevenson on the grounds that a manufacturer only owes a duty of care to someone uh, with whom the manufacturer is in a contractual relationship. And May Donahue did not buy her beer directly from Stevenson, the manufacturer. And in fact, she didn't even pay for the, the ice cream float that was purchased by her companion. So she had no contract with anybody in this scenario. She was simply a consumer. And and uh, in her case, the Scottish Appeal Court that heard it uh, felt that they had to follow the precedents. The other cases that had dealt with, uh, for example, mice in ginger beer bottles. And the Scottish Appeal Court said that the only difference between Mrs. Donahue's case and these other cases was the difference between a rodent and a gastropod, and that this, according to the law of Scotland, amounted to no difference at all. Um, and Walter Leachman, undaunted by the string of losses in the Scottish courts, um, appealed to the House of Lords, and in his closing argument to the House of Lords said, the whole of the law of tort can be comprised in the golden maxim to do unto your neighbor as you would that he should do unto you. In other words, if you can see that your actions, your failure to adequately inspect your factory to make sure that it's not contaminated by rodents and gastropods, if you can foresee that your actions may cause injury to your neighbor, and it would be right to take steps to avoid that injury, then you should, if you would expect similar reasonable steps to be taken by your neighbors insofar as risks of harm to you. And the House of Lords agreed with that submission in a split decision in the 3-2 ruling, and Lord Atkin uh, espoused what's now very well known in the law of torts as the neighbor principle. The rule that you are to love your neighbor becomes in law, you must not injure your neighbor. And the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor, receives a restricted reply. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee would be likely to injure your neighbor. And uh, the dissenting judge took the position that this was far too broad a rule. It's a rule that had not been previously recognized by the common law. And, uh, and the dissenting judge suggests that if such a duty exists, between the manufacturer of uh, food or beverage and the ultimate consumer, then there's no reason why such a duty shouldn't be recognized in many other contexts. If one step, why not 50, said the judge. Uh, if a house, as it sometimes is, is negligently built and in, and in consequence of that negligence, the ceiling falls and injures the occupier or anyone else, 
will a duty of care be recognized? And the dissenting judge thought it was ludicrous to think that a duty of care would exist in those kinds of circumstances. Well, those concerns have come to pass. Over the course of the last 80 years, Donahue versus Stevenson has exerted uh, a, a profound, uh, had a profound impact on the evolution of negligence law. Duties of care have been recognized in many different contexts. The liability insurance industry has, of course, grown dramatically as a result. The capacity of manufacturers and others to absorb losses has changed very much as a result as well compared to the 1920s. And the neighbor principle espoused by Lord Atkin uh, continues to provide the terrain on which struggles over the appropriate boundaries of tort liability are played out. For example, in 2008, the Supreme Court of Canada issued a, a ruling in a case involving a dead fly in a water bottle that drew, of course, explicitly on the precedent of Donahue versus Stevenson to recognize that there was a breach of a duty of care in that case. In 2007, the Supreme Court of Canada cited Donahue versus Stevenson to find that the police owe a duty of care to suspects in a police investigation to not conduct their investigation negligently to cause harm to people who, it turns out, were wrongfully uh, charged. So these are examples of the dynamism uh, uh, of the law and the importance of Donahue versus Stevenson and the evolution of, of the law of negligence and the law of torts generally. And uh, if you end up in my torts course in the fall, you already know most of what you need to know. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Ryder. Uh, so for a perspective from contracts, Professor Stephanie Beneshai. Can you hear me? Yes? No? Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, it is really a pleasure to welcome you here because uh, the first time I sat in this room was in the fall of 1997 when I first took uh, contract law here. Um, and I must admit, it was the first time in my life when I enjoyed school. And so I basically decided to stay here for a long time. And in the fall of 2003, I uh, had the opportunity for the first time to teach contract law uh, to Osgood students, and I've been doing so ever since. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about how I would approach uh, Donahue and Stevenson. First of all, if you are going to be in my section in the fall, you're not going to hear about Donahue and Stevenson because I don't teach the case. So I guess I could stop here, but uh, I won't because uh, Professor Gavigan might get angry with me. Uh, instead, let me pick up on a few of the comments that Professor Gavin did make when she was telling you about the case. Uh, she mentioned that there was no contractual relationship between Donahue and the drinks manufacturer or even the cafe owner, uh, as Donahue had not ordered or paid for the drink. In fact, it was her friend who had done so. So it is the case, or it was the case, that there was a contractual relationship between the cafe owner and Donahue's friend, but it wasn't the friend that had been harmed. So this raises an issue that we do talk about in contract law, and if you join me in the fall, you'll find out about, and it's called the doctrine of privity of contract. The doctrine of privity of contract, and I should say, I most certainly don't teach it in this manner, um, if you were in the class, uh, we'd have a lot of dialogue and um, I'd really be calling on you to kind of flesh out what this doctrine is rather than kind of uh, giving it to you in this way. But the doctrine of privity of contract deals with who can enforce or sue on a contract, okay? There's generally two types of people uh, that bring this issue up. The first is a complete stranger to the contract and the second is a beneficiary under the contract. And it's the beneficiary that generally presents the more difficult set of problems, okay? Uh, and we might argue, and this is al also can be a point of contention, that in this instance, Donahue could be construed as a beneficiary under that contract. The case uh, that is often used to teach this principle of privity of contract uh, dates back to 1861 and is called Tweedle and Atkinson. It's an English case. Uh, in my contract law class, we don't just jump right to 1861. We take some time to get there and figure out how the cases have moved since then, and then we come right up to the present. 
but I'm just going to leave you lingering a bit in 1861. Okay? So what happened in Tweedle and Atkinson in 1861? The situation and the contract at issue was much like many that arose at that time and that you find in the case books. It related to a marriage. And the promises that were exchanged, or the contract that was entered into, involved the groom's father, John Tweedle, agreeing to pay the bride's father, William Guy. Um, sorry, both, I'm sorry, both the fathers basically agreed to pay the groom 200 pounds, okay? So John Tweedle and William Guy each agreed to pay the groom 200 pounds. And if we had more time, we'd talk about why such an agreement was entered into, the social conditions at the time that would necessitate or justify such a contract. But instead, I'll take you right to the breach of contract, which is often where we look uh, for decisions, because if there hasn't been a breach, there's not a remedy sought, and we don't usually have a decision to look at. Okay? So what happens is William Guy dies, and his estate won't pay the 200 pounds that he promised to pay. So who sues him? The other father? No. William Tweedle sues him. William Tweedle being the groom. So William Tweedle was not privy to the contract, but he was a beneficiary under the contract. And it's through the decision in Tweedle and Atkinson and a few others in that period of time that we begin to see the emergence of the doctrine of privity of contract. And the court holds that third parties to contracts cannot enforce them, and the privity of contract doctrine is born. If you want to continue and figure out what the law is in 2012, well, you'll have to join me in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephanie. Now, for a, are we doing a criminal law perspective on this? I know you're wondering how could we be doing a criminal law perspective on it, but let's try. <laughs> so that's the almost immediate reaction anyone would have, whether you're someone who's a novice and just coming to law for the first time. How could Donahue and Stevenson have anything to do with criminal law? And there's a reason you feel that way, and it's a reason that will bring to the surface quite quickly when you start studying criminal law in September. But it is uh, at the crux of the division between criminal law and tort law. And, and it's the idea of mens rea, which is a, just a Latin term that means guilty mind. And so what distinguishes criminal law from tort law is uh, this requirement that not only does your action have to cause harm, but you have to intend to cause harm. That's what marks out criminal behavior as opposed to just negligent behavior of the variety that occasions a tort and results in damages. So how could Donahue and Stevenson, which is the seminal negligence case, be viewed, at, uh, viewed from the perspective of criminal law? Well, you'd have to play with the facts to make it into a criminal law case. You'd have to use your imagination. Um, it's interesting if you go back and look at the history of manufacturing of um, beverages during this period in, in Scotland, and ginger beer in particular, uh, it wasn't actually that rare for um, uh, foreign substances, including um, uh, snails and slugs, to make their way into the uh, manufacturing process and find themselves uh, concealed in the opaque bottles that used to uh, uh, be the, uh, the receptacle for the ginger beer. And one of the reasons that uh, uh, opaque bottles were used was there was a sediment that would end up resting at the bottom of these bottles. And uh, obviously, you don't want to advertise that. Uh, a clear bottle would deter people from buying the ginger beer. And you'd hope that the sediment would stay at the bottom of the bottle and not make its way onto the, onto the, onto the food. And it was partly uh, the yeast that they used to give the ginger beer its alcohol-like flavor that was responsible for the sediment. So that's, that's the sort of way in which these bottles came to be opaque. But it was quite common during this period for snails and slugs to make their way into ginger beer bottles. It's not unheard of in Glasgow. And it's been attributed historically to the fact that uh, it was a very damp climate, um, rain sod and Scottish climate. And so you know, there were a lot of snails and snug, uh, slugs uh, around. And so you know, they'd make their way into the factories and make their way into the, the vats and end up in the ginger beer. But how about thinking about it differently and, and considering 
maybe there was someone behind it all, right? <laughs> maybe there was some um, prankster or uh, uh, individual who had a gripe with the ginger beer manufacturers, uh, a disgruntled employee who was responsible for placing the slugs and snails in the ginger beer. Now, if you can imagine that, there's no factual foundation for that at all, and we look for facts usually in criminal law and old litigation, frankly, but let's just wildly speculate because it's an exercise. Um, if someone was putting the snails or the slugs into the bottles deliberately, now we have the makings of a crime, right? Because we have that key that is the distinguishing feature between crime and tort. We have mens rea, right? We have someone intentionally setting out to cause harm. And so that person, if they did such a thing, would be guilty of administering a noxious substance or attempting to administer a noxious substance or uh, arguably even attempted murder. I mean, it would depend on the circumstances and what they specifically foresaw in terms of the likely harm that would be occasioned. So that's way, one way in which you could sort of look at Donahue and Stevenson as a criminal law case. You'd have to get rather creative and, and, and speculative in, in conjuring up the facts. But here's another way of thinking about the case. Um, and it's more controversial. And it's where the line between tort and criminal law is, is, is much blurrier than in the example where you have someone deliberately putting snails and slugs into ginger beer for the purposes of harming people. That would be criminal to be sure. Um, but what about a manufacturer who doesn't simply fail to take adequate care, right? They're just negligent. Oh, they didn't turn their mind to it. Oh, I could put a screen that would be fine enough to filter out anything that could adulter the uh, ginger beer, and that would prevent slugs and snails from making it their way into the vats that end up being poured into the bottles. Um, I, I didn't realize I could do that. It had never occurred to me. Um, wow, I'm sorry about that. That's negligence, right? A reasonable person would have foreseen that you should do those sorts of things to make sure that the, 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 the product that you're manufacturing is safe for consumption. But what if the, uh, the particular proprietor had found snails and slugs over time? And people had come in and said, oh, your snail and slug problem. Yeah, until you put this screen that costs, you know, $17 on the, um, uh, on, on the vats as the liquid is being poured, you're going to keep getting those slugs and those snails. Really, I am? Yes, you are. And not only that, you're going to kill somebody. Uh, $17 to fix the problem. And the greedy uh, manufacturer says, nah, no one's going to sue. It's mostly poor people who are buying the ginger beer. I'll run the risk. Right? Um, how about if you're manufacturing a car, and a little fix would prevent people from dying, an automotive, uh, uh, in the explosion of gas tanks, uh, effectively constructed gas tanks, if you just spend a little bit of money, you make a deliberate decision not to spend that money, knowing that a lot of people are going to die. Now the line between tort and crime starts to get blurrier. And, and you start wondering whether the person who subjectively foresees this risk of harm and does the you know, uh, thing nevertheless and fails to take the precautionary steps nevertheless, whether that person should start being characterized not as a tort feaser, which they are, right, the tort wrongdoer, but should they be considered a criminal? Right? Is that so wrongful that it should be called a crime? And Criminal law is still grappling with that question at the moment. The, the, the line between criminal negligence and civil negligence is still being debated to this day. And if you're interested in that debate, please join us in the fall and we'll continue the discussion in criminal law. Thanks. Thanks very much, Professor Staropoulos. And last but not least, how this would all come together in a case, Professor Trevor Farrow, who's going to hang on to your seats Thanks very much. So um, I was conscious of the time. We've just heard about a number of things that you might expect to get in tort law, criminal law, uh, in contract law. I'm going to now talk a little bit about procedural law, which is the how-to. How are we going to get those things that you might expect? So let's look at four questions. The first is, cast your mind back, you are now made. What are you looking for? What do you want out of this? You just had a month off work. What are you looking for? Compensation for lost wages. Compensation for lost wages. Okay, good. Anyone else? Some acknowledgement that this shouldn't have happened to me. Some acknowledgement that it shouldn't have happened. 
What would that look like? I would want an apology and I want money attached to that apology. So okay, so an apology <coughs> and maybe some money. Anything else? Preventing future cases. Preventing future cases. Okay, terrific. So not just this one, but we don't want the same thing to happen again. Anything else? Sorry? Okay, it was a really good idea, wasn't it? <laughs> um, anything else? Medical expenses. Medical expenses. We've got some good ideas here. So those are the kinds of things that you might be looking for if you're the client, okay? So the next question I want to ask you quickly is who from? Who are we going to get this stuff from? So we had um, lost wages, we had medical um, expenses, we had an apology. Who's going to give us this stuff? The manufacturer. The manufacturer. Okay, and so the guy who made the bottle, Davy Stevenson, who we might look to him, who made the stuff. Who else? Who are we going to get an apology from? The manufacturer. Maybe the manufacturer. How are we going to stop this happening again? Terrific. So we have a court case. There's a decision, and then folks read that, and the press reports on it. We see we better not do this. Similarly situated manufacturers, because Davy just got whacked for what he did to make. So the idea of behavior modification in terms of how we do law. It's not just about the name. It's about the rest of the names in the world that are about to drink that bottle. That's what we do with civil procedures, help to find something for them too. Okay. Um, then the third question I want to ask is, so how are you going to do it? How are you going to get the apology? How are you going to get the medical expenses? Are we going to do rock, paper, scissors, <laughs> leave back in <laughs> adjusting? The court. Um, what's that? The court. The court. Okay, so one option is the court. Okay, that's a good option. Settlement. Settlement. What's settlement? Uh, the parties, the manufacturer decides to, to pay that instead of what's the overtime. Right. So May and Davey sit down and maybe have a conversation and say, let's get a deal done here and settle the case. Right? And so it's some kind of a negotiation. Any other ideas how we might deal with this? Those are the kind of things when we think about the tools at our disposal, at our client's disposal, that we as lawyers need to know about. What's our toolkit? for how to get the remedies in tort, how to get the remedies in contract, what to do about criminal law. The thing about civil procedure is the how-to. What are we going to do about it? Um, and where are we going to go to court? Is it better to go to negotiation? There's all sorts of reasons to do either, and there's others. Fourth question I want to leave you with. Now let's cast your mind into the seat of the lawyer. May's lawyer, Walter Leachman. The question I now want to ask you is, can you do anything? Can you lie, cheat, and steal to get something for May? Probably not. <laughs> and you're going to find in the law more and more that your intuitions are often really important, and you're exactly right. Probably not. Um, is it more about that? Probably not. <laughs> more about that, probably, in first year. The idea is how does the lawyer, Walter, have to conduct him or herself on behalf of the client to get what she wants? She's desperate to get something, but can you do it at all costs? And there's a conversation there. It's called professionalism, it's called ethics and how we conduct ourselves as lawyers doing this stuff. If you're interested in any of that, come to Civil Procedure in the first year, and we'll talk more about it. <laughs>
In terms of parking, if you've parked in any of the structures um, on, uh, at York University, the Arboretum, the student services parking structure, we will give you an exit ticket that will enable you to get out of the parking structure gratis. Um, just make sure you have one of those in your hand before you leave um, from our registration table. If you have any other parking issues, um, please don't hesitate to be in touch with us at the admissions office. Um, the decision deadline, as you know, is April 2nd. Uh, con you'll need to send your confirmation of acceptance form and your deposit to us by that date. In the meantime, um, as you're making this important decision, please feel free to get in touch with us in the admissions office if we can be of any further assistance. Um, once again, thank you so much to our panel. You did an amazing job. Thank you all for coming today, and we hope to see you next September.